In the previous section of the book, uh, we've seen a whole suite of exponential smoothing models, innovation states-based models that underlie exponential smoothing methods. Um, and specifically, we saw uh, 18 of these, nine with additive errors and nine with multiplicative errors. Now, we need an efficient way um, of being able to actually estimate these and a way of selecting between these. We don't know which one to use and where to use them. Now let's start first with estimating the models. Um, in the most general form, we have three smoothing coefficients and we also have the dampening parameter. And we also need to um, estimate for each state an initial state because these relationships that we saw are recursive, if you remember. Hence, these processes need to start from somewhere. Hence, we've got a whole um, heap of initial uh, parameters or initial values for uh, one for um, the level, one for the trend, and m for the seasonal components. Now, the way we're going to estimate um, these models is to actually do maximum likelihood estimation. So, maximum likelihood. The idea is that we want to maximize the probability um, that you observe the data, that the data that you observe comes from the model you are interested in. Hence, given the data, maximize the likelihood that the data you have comes from that model. Now, for additive errors, for models with additive errors, it turns out to be um, equivalent to minimizing sum of squared errors. For models with multiplicative errors where you have heteroscedastic errors, relative errors, this is not equivalent to minimizing sum of squared errors. Now let's, in, I will not show you the full derivation of the likelihood. Uh, this goes a little bit beyond what we have in the book, um, but um, it is quite neat to see this, uh, the, the um, tools used and what it was developed over the years by um, this very neat notation by uh, Rob and co-authors such as Ralph Snyder, Keith Ord, and Ann Collar. So basically, what we do is grab our, um, all our states and we stack them in a vector, and we call this vector xt. Now, we also assume that our uh, errors, our innovations, are iid uh, normal zero single squared. Now, having stacked the, all the states like this, we're able to actually generalize the form that we um, can write. We can write all the models in this very general form. So basically, um, in the observation equation, we have the, the actual observation is a function of our states plus another function interacted with our errors. And each, and each of the state equations is a function of previous states plus another function interactive with innovation errors. If you go back to, um, let's switch over to um, having a look a little bit of the equations for these models, you'll see that um, that the general form that I just presented to you uh, actually captures each and one of these models. Right? So if you have a look, the, your observation equation comprises a function of the states plus an error. Your state equation um, comprises a function of the previous states plus an error. Oops. Hence, um, we, can, we can use this generalized form, this neat notation to write down the likelihood function for all the models in, in, in one go. Um, now for additive errors, k of h, uh, k of the states or the function of the states is equal to one. Hence, you'll see that all our equations end up looking like this, where yt is equal to mu t, so a function of the states, a mean plus an error. Um, for multiplicative errors, that is not the case. Kx to um, the, the function of the states is equal to mu t. Hence, there's a common uh, component, common factor that comes out from the first bit and the second bit. Hence, our observation equation is written down like this. Now, assuming that our errors are normally distributed, we can actually write down the likelihood function, which uh, basically involves the joint PDF of the normal distribution. So uh, it's not too hard to write down, but it's sort of a little bit beyond this uh, textbook. Um, 
and it turns out that maximizing the likelihood is equivalent to minimizing this guy here, right? So um, actually, and this guy is actually equivalent. You can see that uh, maximizing, um, uh, um, so maximizing the likelihood is equivalent to minimizing this, which is equal to minus two times the likelihood, log likelihood plus a constant. So there's some other stuff here, which I've ignored, um, but maximizing the likelihood is equal to maximizing the likelihood is equal to minimizing uh, this. Um, so if, so we want to, we're going to minimize this guy and we're going to estimate the parameters by minimizing this guy. Um, for additive models, just to uh, make a point, remember that kx, kx is equal to one. So log of one is equal to zero. Hence, this goes away and hence, uh, maximize the likelihood is the same as minimizing sum of squared errors, right? So that stays, that's the only thing that stays in that function. Now let's talk a little bit about, um, about uh, some more theoretical and, and stuff that we need underpinning these models. And uh, the first thing we can talk about is uh, parameter restrictions. As you've seen, as we build these models and these methods, our, our parameters uh, are restricted. Um, traditionally, all our smoothing coefficients are restricted to be between zero and one, um, so that our equations can be interpreted as uh, weighted averages. Now, in the models, um, we said that vita is equal to alpha vita star. We've gone through this in previous sections of the book, and gamma is equal to one minus alpha gamma star. Um, therefore, it turns out that the traditional parameters can be mapped into these, the traditional parameter restrictions can be mapped into uh, alpha being between 0 and 1, vita being between uh, 0 and alpha, and gamma being between 0 and 1 minus alpha. We also restrict our dampening parameter to be between 0.8 and 0.98. So if phi reaches 1, then you can't tell the difference between a damped model, a damped Holtz model, and the linear trend model. So we wanted to separate from there. And if phi goes uh, down, that causes some trouble with the estimation. It actually zaps out some states. Hence, we restrict it to be point eight, between 0 0.8 and 0 0.98 uh, if you are to choose a model with a dampening parameter. Now you can think about these restrictions in a more mathematical way. And the mathematical thinking is that we, you want to um, prevent your observations in the distant past having a continuing effect on current forecasts, right? The idea of exponential smoothing. Now, if you just think about that, these, there's a set of restrictions which, which allow you to be in this, what we call admissible region. Uh, which are usually, but not always, less restrictive than the traditional region. So for the uh, simple exponential smoothing model for the ETS A and N, um, the traditional restriction of the smoothing coefficient would be that the smoothing coefficient alpha is between zero and one, uh, while the admissible region is between uh, zero um, and two. So um, in, in the ETS function actually accounts for both of these, so it won't make a difference in this case. But in some cases, the admissible region is more restrictive than uh, than the traditional one, and um, ETS will impose that. Now we've estimated the models. How are we going to choose between them? Well, we're going to choose between them using model selection criteria. So the first model selection criteria is Akaiki's information criteria, the AIC which basically is um, a function of the log likelihood plus a penalty term, two times the number of parameters and initial states estimated in the model. Now, alternative to that, or an improved version to that is um, the corrected AIC, corrected for small sample bias. Um, and a third criterion usually uh, looked at is the Bayesian information criterion or the BIC which is basically places a heavier penalty um, than uh, the AIC, uh, than the AIC does. So if log of t is greater than two, then this the BIC will choose a more parsimonious model. Now, BIC is not actually um, focused, does not actually focus on forecasting. Uh, it's got other optimality properties. So usually we don't use BIC. Um, and we use the other two. Um, 
And I'll show you in the next slide, which is probably, let's move to that, which was probably, I guess, one of the most significant results uh, in this chapter. Um, and it's the moment that Akaiki realizes that minimizing the AIC, assuming that your residuals are Gaussian and you have enough data asymptotically, is equivalent to minimizing a one-step time series cross-validation MSE. So this is a, an extraordinary result. Think about it when you have a very large model, or even, even more challenging if you have many very large models, you need you know, a few years of data before you can do any cross-validation, any one-step cross-validation. Uh, and also, it's a very complex setting that you need to set up to run these as cross-validation. Well, Akeika realized that um, minimizing the AIC is actually equivalent to looking at one-step uh, uh, time series cross-validation. Hence, we mostly use the AIC. The default setting in the ETS function is to use the corrected AIC, the, so the AICC, in case you have small samples. Now, all this led the combination of being able to write down the likelihood function in such a general form, and then doing the model selection led to automatic forecasting uh, and a paper by uh, Rob and co-authors in the International Journal of Forecasting in 2002. So basically we apply um, each model that is appropriate to the data. We estimate this model and optimize parameters and initial values using maximum likelihood estimation. Um, then we select the method using the AICC, the corrected AIC. We produce forecasts and forecast intervals using the underlying state space model, innovation state space models. And um, it's in its first go, this, this algorithm performed really well in the M3 competition where you had to um, forecast 3,003 uh, time series. We need to mention that there is, there are some combinations of the components that lead to some instabilities, so some unstable models. So basically, um, if you have a look at the set of um, additive error models, um, and especially the combination of additive um, uh, errors and multiplicative uh, um, seasonal component, there's some, um, models for which we divide through by a state and that causes some instability. Um, hence, these combinations of error and seasonality, the AM combination causes some instability um, and uh, uh, we, we, you know, we need to be aware of that and we may not look at those models. Um, also, uh, models with multiplicative errors, with relative errors, uh, are useful only for strictly positive data, right? So it's relative errors, negative values don't make much sense. So if you got some negative values, then out of the, all the suite of models, um, you may just look at the um, six additive models having uh, ignored and having not used the ones that can cause uh, instabilities. Let's have a look at an example of uh, of implementing this algorithm. So uh, in the global economy at Sybil, we're gonna look at the population variable. So we're gonna forecast basically uh, population of each country. Easy, we pass the data into the model function and we choose ETS as our model. Um, and that's our variable that we're gonna be uh, uh, concentrating on forecasting. So it's population divided by millions, just to bring it back in the scale. And um, we get a Mabel object back with uh, one row for each country, one estimated model for each country. So uh, you see the chosen and estimated models here are combinations of some error trend, no seasonal component of this annual data. And sometimes um, the process chooses additive errors, sometimes it chooses uh, multiplicative errors. We can take the Mabel, of course, and pipe it into the forecast function and generate some forecasts, and we get back um, uh, distributional forecasts. Now, one thing that we need to talk about is the difference between the residuals, or what we label here, the response residuals, and the innovations, innovation residuals. Now, our response residuals, our usual residuals, uh, one-step uh, uh, in-sample residuals are always defined by as yt minus, the yt hat conditional on t minus one. In 
the models here, there's a difference between the additive error models where the innovation is equivalent to this in-sample um, error, or but it is not the case with multiplicative error models where we have relative errors. Okay, so, and we need to make sure that we understand the difference between the two. Just to um, demonstrate this, let's take the tourism table and aggregate or select the holiday purpose of travel and aggregate over um, trips. So we're going to forecast this um, uh, this Oz holidays uh, Sybil time series using an ATS uh, model, and the model returned is an MNM, so multiplicative errors, no trend, multiplicative seasonality. And let's print out the components. So the difference, what we want to notice here is that our seasonal component um, is, of course, uh, multiplicative, but also our errors that we look at, the remainder is a relative error. Okay, it's not an innovation. It is not, sorry, it's, it's not a, a, a response uh, residual. It's not a residual YT minus YT hat conditional T minus one. It is actually the relative error. And we can actually plot the two and see the difference. So the default setting is to uh, plot the innovation. This is what we care about this is what we make assumptions about if we want to have a look at the response variable um, we we um, uh, call for the type equals response and we can get that back um, we can also use the augment function and print these out and you can see the difference between the residual column and the innovation column so innovation residuals are the epsilon t hats, while regular residuals are always yt minus yt hat conditional on t minus one.